Vitamins Necessary for a Healthy Mind and Body George Scarseth, Ph.D., former Director of Research for the American Farm Research Association in Lafayette, Indiana, told about a village on the seacoast of Africa. The village is more advanced than a community of similar tribes in the interior. Why? Because its inhabitants are physically stronger and more mentally alert. They have more bodily energy than the interior tribesmen. The difference between the tribesmen on the coast and those living inland stems from a difference in diet. The village tribesmen in the interior do not have a sufficient amount of protein, whereas those on the coast obtain quantities from the fish they eat. In his book, Climate Makes the Man, Clarence Mills wrote that the United States government found some inhabitants of the Isthmus of Panama excessively sluggish in their mental and physical activity. A scientific study disclosed that both the plant and animal life on which they depended for food lacked the B vitamins. When thiamine was added to their diet, the same people became more energetic and active. If you suspect that your diet is deficient in certain vitamins and elements so that your energy level is depressed, you should do something about it. A good cookbook can help you, and there are government pamphlets available at low cost. If the condition persists, have a physical checkup. Like your body, your subconscious mind will accept and absorb mental and spiritual vitamins without effort. But unlike your physical body, the subconscious will digest and retain unlimited quantities. Unlike your stomach, it never becomes stuffed. It will take and hold as much as you feed it, and still hold more. Where will you find these mental and spiritual vitamins? In books such as those recommended in Chapter 22, The Amazing Power of a Bibliography. In effect, the subconscious mind is like a battery. From it, you can obtain tremendous surges of mental and spiritual energy which often transmute themselves into physical vitality. These jolts of energy will go to waste if we permit them to be short-circuited by needless negative emotions. But used constructively, this energy can multiply itself many times, just as a powerhouse generator produces vast amounts of useful power. The late William C. Lengel who was a prominent editor-in-chief in the book publishing business, illustrated this point beautifully in an article for Success Unlimited magazine. Lengel described how energy is wasted through needless worry, hate, fear, suspicion, anger, and rage. All these waste elements, he said, could just as easily be transformed into power-producing units. To illustrate his point, Mr. Lengel drew a picture of an electrical power plant. The open mouths of the furnaces, the red flames roaring inside, the water in the steam gauges bobbing at proper temperature level, the steam driving the pistons turning the great generators, the copper commutators, golden surfaces, revolving so fast they seem motionless, green and blue sparks flashing from under the brushes, thick cables hooked up to the switchboard, carrying the electrical current throughout a city for thousands of useful purposes. Then, the other side of the picture, Lingle continued. Same plant, same boilers, engines, generators. The only difference being that the switchboard was dark, and the heavy cables, instead of being hooked up to the switchboard, were stuck down into a barrel of water while the workmen ran tests on the plant. All of the power is, in effect, wasted. Not an elevator able to run, not a machine able to operate, not a single bulb able to light. And Lingle concluded that in the same way, a failure uses up as much energy in his work at failing as a successful person uses in winning success. Tommy Bolt, the golf champion, used to waste his energy that way. If he sliced a ball or missed the green, he would let go with a fit of temper. Frequently, he'd become so angry that he'd wrap a golf club around the nearest tree. When he read the famous prayer of St. Francis of Assisi, it changed him into a man who directed his energy into the most fruitful channels. The prayer gave Tommy new peace of mind, and ever since then he has carried in his pocket a card imprinted with a portion of the prayer. It reads, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. 
man is the only member of the animal kingdom who, through the functioning of his conscious mind, can voluntarily control his emotions from within rather than be forced to do so by external influences. He alone can deliberately change habits of emotional response. The more civilized, cultured, and refined you are, the easier you can control your emotions and feelings if you choose to do so. Fear, for example, is good under certain circumstances. If it were not for fear of water, many children would drown. However, it is entirely possible that you are wasting your mental and spiritual energy in this or other misdirected emotions. If so, you can throw a switch to direct the energy into useful channels. How? By keeping your mind on the things you do want and off the things you don't want. Your emotions are immediately subject to action. Therefore, get into action. Substitute a positive feeling for the negative one. For example, if you are fearful and want to be courageous, act courageous. If you want to be energetic, act energetic. But make sure, of course, that your energy is expended to a good and useful purpose. Don Fraser of Australia gives us a wonderful case in point. Born on the wrong side of the tracks in Balmain, a waterside suburb of Sydney, Don had an anemic body but she had a king-sized determination to become a great swimming champion. She became the world's fastest woman swimmer. She was good, but sometimes she wasn't quite good enough to satisfy herself. While flying home from the Cardiff Empire Games, she read a book. It was Think and Grow Rich. I found Napoleon Hill's formulas for success most inspiring, she says. I began thinking about our defeat by the English girls in the medley relay when in the freestyle leg I swam 60.6 seconds. That was six-tenths of a second faster than my own world record, but still not good enough to give us the 12-yard start we needed. I wondered whether I had given everything in me on that final lap. Dawn Frazier began thinking about the dream she'd had for so long, to become the first woman to swim 100 meters in less than 60 seconds. The magic minute, she called it. If I could have made that final leg in the magic minute, we might have won, she thought. From that moment, the old hope of cracking the minute became a burning desire with me. Call it a controlled obsession, if you like. I made it my major ambition and formed a plan of positive action with the magic minute as my goal. As Mr. Hill advises, I decided to go the extra mile, mentally as well as physically. In addition to training her body, Miss Frazier now conditions her mind as well. She cracked record after record and eventually achieved her goal. Athletic coaches throughout Australia have been attracted to study Napoleon Hill's teachings, according to Thomas H. Weingard, an Australian newspaper man. Top coaches, in their search for methods that will give their champions just that little bit extra over and above their regular scientifically devised training program, are finding new inspiration in the doctrines of the great American expert, Weingart says. They are adapting Napoleon Hill's technique of mental approach to what is, essentially, a physical problem. Some have taken the PMA Science of Success course so they may apply the principles correctly. Is it time for you to recharge your battery? Have you now begun to apply the principles presented in Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude? Are you ready to become a champion? If so, you will want to learn how you can enjoy good health and live longer, the subject of our next chapter. Pilot number 16. Thoughts to Steer By 1. How is your energy level at this moment? 2. What is your most important source of physical, mental, and spiritual energy? 3. How can you apply the principles Dr. Thomas Kirk Curitan taught to Roger Bannister so that you'll have extra energy to achieve your own goals? 4. Do you push to the limit of your endurance, then rest and try again? 5. Is it time to recharge your battery? 6. How can you avoid or neutralize fatigue? 7. Are most of your meals based on well-balanced diets? 8. 
Do you take spiritual and mental vitamins daily by reading inspirational material or listening to inspirational tapes or records? 9. Is your energy being directed toward useful channels, or is it being short-circuited and wasted? 10. A failure uses up as much energy in his work at failing as a successful person uses in winning success. 11. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. 12. When is the emotion of fear justified, unjustified? 13. To be energetic, act energetically. Increase your energy level through PMA. Chapter 17 You Can Enjoy Good Health and Live Longer Positive mental attitude plays an important role in your health and your day-to-day -day energies and enthusiasms for your life and your work. Every day, in every way, through the grace of God, I am getting better and better is no pie-in-the-sky jargon for the man who recites the sentence several times each day upon awakening and again before going to bed. In one sense, he is putting PMA forces to work for him. He is using the forces which attract the better things of life to him. He is using the forces which the authors of Success Through a Positive Mental Attitude want you to use. How PMA Aids You PMA will help you develop mental and physical health and a longer life. And NMA will just as surely undermine mental and physical health and shorten your life. It all depends upon which side of the talisman you turn up. Positive mental attitude properly employed has saved the lives of many persons because someone close to them had a strong positive mental attitude. The following incident proves the point. The baby was only two days old when the doctor said, The child won't live. The child will live, responded the father. The father had a positive mental attitude. He had faith. He believed in the miracle of prayer. He prayed. He also believed in action. And he got into action. He placed the child under the care of a pediatrician who also had a positive mental attitude. A doctor who knew from experience that for every physical weakness, nature provides a compensating factor. The child did live. I can't go on. Death separates pair, for instant. The above headline appeared in the Chicago Daily News. The article mentioned that a building engineer, a 62-year-old man, came home and went to bed with chest pains and shortness of breath. His wife, who was ten years younger, became alarmed and began hopefully to rub her husband's arms to increase circulation. But he died. I can't stand to go on any more, the widow told her mother, who was beside her. And then the widow died. She died that very same day. The baby that lived and the widow who died demonstrate the powerful forces of positive and negative mental attitudes. Knowing that accentuating the positive will attract good things to you and accepting the negative will bring the bad isn't it common sense to develop positive thoughts and attitudes? If you have not already done so, now is the time to develop a PMA philosophy. Prepare for any possible emergency. Always have something to live for. And remember, when you have something to live for, the subconscious mind forces upon your conscious mind strong motivating factors to keep you alive in times of emergency. We need look no further than Raphael Correa to prove our point. An eventful night. He was only twenty years of age. His family was not wealthy, yet it was particularly well esteemed. Therefore, six doctors and a young intern had struggled all night in that small operating room at San Juan, Puerto Rico, trying to save Raphael's life. Now, after twelve hours of unceasing watchfulness and attention, they were tired, and they were sleepy. Try as they would, they were finally unable to hear his heartbeat. They couldn't find his pulse. The head surgeon took a knife and cut the blood vessels in Raphael's wrist. The fluid was yellow. The surgeon hadn't used an anesthetic, for the boy's body was so weak that pain didn't seem possible. 
The doctors thought he could not hear what they were saying, and they spoke as if he were dead. One said, Not even a miracle can save him now. The chief surgeon took off his surgical coat and prepared to leave the room. The young intern asked, May I have the body? Yes, was the response. The doctors left the room. It has been written, So we do not lose heart, because we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. They could see the physical body, but Raphael was a mind with a body. What was happening to the mind of Raphael Correa which was not visible? In that twilight state between life and death, Raphael was not able consciously to move his body. But because of the positive mental attitude he had developed in his subconscious mind by reading inspirational books, his mind was communicating with a higher power. He felt that God was with him. He began to speak to God as a friend, like a man talking with another. You know me. You are inside me. You are my blood. You are my life. You are my everything. There is but one mind, one principle, one substance in the universe, and I am one with all else. If I die, I don't lose anything. I just change form. But I am only twenty years old. Dear God, I'm not afraid to die, but I'm willing to live. If you choose to give me life, someday, somehow, I'll be able and willing through your mercy to lead a better life and to help others. As the intern approached Raphael, he looked at Raphael's face and observed the twitching of his eyelids and a teardrop falling from the corner of his left eye. Doctor, doctor, come quickly. I think he's alive, he called excitedly. It took more than a year for him to regain his strength, but Raphael Correa did live. Some years later, Raphael flew from San Juan to Chicago to ask the authors to hold a three-evening PMA seminar at San Juan. It was then that Raphael told us his story of that eventful night in his life. We were inspired by his story, and particularly also by the fact that since he had been granted his life, he was trying to make good on his promise to help others. We flew to San Juan to conduct the seminar. While we were in San Juan, Raphael introduced us to the chief surgeon who had been with him all that night, and the doctor confirmed Raphael's story. During the course of the conversation, we asked Raphael, What was the name of the book that influenced you in your hour of need? Raphael replied, I had read many inspirational books, but I believe the thoughts that went through my mind that night were primarily from Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. As proved by Raphael, inspirational books are tremendously instrumental in changing lives, and there is no book with more inspiration and motivation than the Bible. The Bible has changed the lives of more persons than any other book. It has helped countless thousands to develop physical, mental, and moral health. Reading the Bible has developed a greater understanding of its truths in many persons and caused them to draw closer to their own church. This is because the Bible has motivated them to positive action. An inspirational book like the one you are now listening to can also motivate you. It can be the catalyst which starts you on the road to desirable, positive action and success. Use a book as a catalyst. The dictionary defines a catalyst in physical chemistry as a substance that causes or accelerates a chemical reaction. The dictionary further states that an anti-catalyst or negative catalyst retards a reaction. The authors recommend that you use good inspirational books as positive catalysts to accelerate your progress toward achievement of true success in life. And they hasten to warn you that you choose such catalysts with care. In Chapter 22 of this book, entitled The Amazing Power of a Bibliography, you will find listed many books which the authors guarantee can act as positive catalysts in your life, if you are ready. Martin J. Coe, in his book Your Greatest Power, tells of a British regiment that used the 91st Psalm as a catalyst to aid them not just to achieve a material goal, but for the very preservation of life itself. Coe wrote, F. L. Rawson, noted engineer, and one of England's greatest scientists, in his book Life Understood, 
gives an account of a British regiment under control of Colonel Whittlesey, which served in the World War for more than four years without losing a man. This unparalleled record was made possible by means of active cooperation of officers and men in memorizing and repeating regularly the words of the 91st Psalm, which has been called the Psalm of Protection. Protection of your life can also be accomplished by protecting your health. And let there be no misunderstanding about it. Your health is one of your most valuable assets. Many a man today would be more than willing to trade his wealth for good health. I'd rather have my health than his money. It is said that a healthy, ambitious 18-year-old clerk in a produce firm in Cleveland, Ohio, developed a major definite aim of becoming the world's richest man. At the age of 57, he retired on doctor's orders. Like many American businessmen, he had it, stomach ulcers and shot nerves. In addition, he was a hated man. I'd rather have my health than his money, many said. John K. Winkler tells the story in John D., A Portrait in Oils. Can money buy physical and mental health, a longer life, and the esteem of your fellow men? When John D. Rockefeller retired from active business, his major definite aims were to develop a healthy body, maintain a healthy mind, live a long life, and later, to win the esteem of his fellow men. Could money buy these? It did. Here's how Rockefeller did it, and what it can mean to you. Rockefeller attended the Baptist church services every Sunday and took notes to learn the principles that he might apply daily. Slept eight hours every night and took short naps every day, and through rest he avoided harmful fatigue. Took a bath or shower every day. He was neat and clean in his appearance. Moved to Florida to a climate conducive to his good health and longevity. Lived a well-balanced life, for fresh air and sunshine were absorbed while he daily engaged in his favorite outdoor sport, golf. And indoor games, reading, and other wholesome activities were enjoyed with regularity. Ate slowly, in moderation, and chewed everything well. The saliva in his mouth was permitted to mix with the masticated foods and liquids, and they were well digested before they were swallowed. They were swallowed at body temperature. Foods too hot or too cold for the mouth were not dumped into his stomach to burn or freeze its lining. Digested mental and spiritual vitamins. For grace was said at each meal, and at dinner it was his custom to have his secretary, a guest or a member of his family read the Bible, a sermon, an inspirational poem, a motivating article from a newspaper, magazine, or book. Employ Dr. Hamilton Fisk Bigger full-time. Dr. Bigger was paid to keep John D. well, happy, and alive. He did this through motivating his patient to develop a cheerful, happy attitude. And Rockefeller lived to be 97 didn't want the hatred of his fellow men to be inherited by the members of his family. Therefore, he began intelligently to share a part of his possessions with the needy. At first, Rockefeller's motive was primarily a selfish one. He wanted a good reputation. Then something happened. By acting generous, he became generous. And by bringing happiness and health to many through his charitable and philanthropic contributions, he found them for himself and the foundations he established will benefit mankind for generations to come. His life and money were instruments for good. This world is a better and healthier world to live in because of John D. Rockefeller. You shouldn't have to amass a fortune before you come to realize that PMA will attract perfect health. But there are some other ingredients which should be used along with PMA, and one of them is health education. Don't be ignorant about your health. The price of ignorance is sin, sickness, and death. What do you know about hygiene? Hygiene is defined as a system of principles or rules designed for the promotion of health. Social hygiene often refers specifically to venereal contagion. Ignorance of physical, mental, and social hygiene can lead to sin, sickness, and death. If you are timid in discussing such matters, 
Read Venture of Faith by Mary Alice and Harold Blake Walker. Today, because of PMA, the family, schools, churches, press, the medical profession, federal and state governments, and youth organizations endeavor to lift the dark cloud of ignorance regarding physical, mental, and social hygiene through education. Prevention is taught as well as cure. But a cure for alcoholism is not so easy to come by as education and hygiene. Alcoholism ranks as the fourth largest health problem in the nation. It follows mental and moral disease and is one of the greatest contributors to those two diseases. The economic cost of alcoholism is $25 billion per year. The greater portion of this is loss of time to industry, followed by hospital costs and physical damages caused mainly by automobile accidents. But the money loss is negligible compared to the loss of physical, mental, and moral health, and the loss of life attributable to alcoholism. An alcoholic has a mental illness which lies dormant until his first drink. If he doesn't start the habit, liquor doesn't have the power of attraction for him. If he drinks, the affinity is strong, and he will drink to excess. If he drinks to excess, the attraction may become irresistible or seem so. And when he tries to resist and doesn't succeed, he may believe he cannot be cured. What happens to excessive drinkers? Alcohol is known to alter the brain waves as recorded by the scientific instrument known as an electroencephalograph. It has a most potent influence on nerve cell metabolism, which results in slow rhythms and eventual suppression of voltage, and brings about a change in the level of consciousness. A human body is alive only as long as its subconscious mind functions. It can be kept alive for a long time without the functioning of the conscious mind. There are degrees of consciousness. Sanity is that healthy state of mind when the activities of the conscious and the subconscious are in proper balance. And while they work together, each has its specific duties. Each has inhibiting factors. While sometimes it is healthful and wholesome for a person to do the things he wants to do but which are forbidden, judgments and actions should be the result of the conscious and subconscious working in balance. The intellect and other powers of the conscious mind act as a governor regulating the subconscious when a person is in a conscious state of activity. As the activity of this governor slows down, the machine begins to run wild, and the individual may act in an illogical manner. His uncontrolled activities may range from a simple foolish act to a state of mind commonly known as insanity. As the inhibiting barriers are lowered, Due to the effect of alcohol on the brain cells, the restraining controls of the conscious mind become less effective. When the emotions, passions, and other activities of the subconscious mind have too free a reign without proper regulation by the balance wheel of the intellect, the individual in this semi-conscious state of mind will commit foolish and undesirable acts due to alcoholic influence. Alcoholism is indeed a dread disease. If allowed to control a person's life, it can render that person physically, mentally, and morally ill, and send him to a living hell. Once alcohol has gained control in a person's life, it does not readily relinquish its hold. But there is a cure. There's always a cure. What's the cure? Stop drinking. For the alcoholic, this is more easily said than done. The important thing is that it can be done. He can do it. When you develop a positive mental attitude, you don't give up trying because you have previously failed or because you know of cases where others have failed. You can be motivated and receive hope from successful experiences. A baby learning to walk isn't criticized for falling after taking the first three steps. It is given credit for the progress it makes in response to its conscious effort. The alcoholic may find help in a number of places. Complete cures for alcoholism have been affected by environmental influences in the religious therapy of established churches, rescue missions like the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago, revival meetings of evangelists like Oral Roberts, Alcoholics Anonymous, 
medical and psychiatric help, including hypnosis. Private hospitals, such as the Keeley Institute at Dwight, Illinois, or an inspirational book like I Dare You. However, each individual must win his own internal victory. But generally, it is necessary for him to come under the environmental influence of someone who will help him through suggestion until he takes control of his own power. Or, if you will, until he has a positive mental attitude developed beyond the point of relapsing into a negative mental attitude. PMA can do wonders for the alcoholic if only he will put it to work for himself. And PMA will work wonders for you, too, in attracting health and longevity. Uncertainty about your health can undermine your PMA by causing you to worry about every little ache or pain. The longer you remain uncertain, the more your attitude changes direction from positive to negative. And if the symptoms you have noticed really do denote a condition that requires attention, the longer you remain uncertain and do nothing, the greater are the opportunities for that condition to develop. Don't be uncertain about your health. Get into action. Take the guesswork out of your health. He was a young, dynamic, successful automobile sales manager. His whole future was ahead of him, yet he was mighty low. In fact, he expected to die. He even selected and purchased his cemetery lot and made all arrangements for his burial. He got his house in order, but here's what actually happened. At times he became short of breath. His heart beat rapidly. His throat choked up. Eventually, he went to his family doctor, who was a very successful physician and surgeon. The doctor advised him to take a rest, to take life easy, to retire from the work he loved, the thrilling game of selling automobiles. The sales manager stayed home for a while and rested his body, but because of fears, his mind was not at ease. He still became short of breath. His heart would beat rapidly. His throat would choke up. It was summertime, and his doctor advised him to vacation in Colorado. He was carried into the Pullman compartment. Colorado, with its healthful climate and inspirational mountains, did not prevent the manifestation of his fears. He would frequently experience shortness of breath, rapid beating of the heart, and the same choked-up feeling. Within a week he returned home. He believed death was coming. Take the guesswork out of it, this salesman was told as you might be told by one of the authors. You have everything to gain and nothing to lose by going to a clinic such as Mayo Brothers at Rochester, Minnesota. Do it now. At his request, he was driven to Rochester by a relative. He was actually afraid that he might die en route. When the sales manager went through the clinic, he was told what was wrong with him. The doctor said, Your difficulty is that you breathe in too much oxygen. He laughed and said, that's silly. The doctor responded, Jump up and down fifty times as if you were jumping rope. He became short of breath, his heart beat rapidly, and his throat choked up. What can I do about it? the young man asked. The doctor responded, When you feel this condition coming on, you can, one, breathe into a paper bag, or two, just hold your breath for a little while. And the doctor handed the patient a paper bag. The patient followed instructions. His heart stopped beating rapidly, breathing became normal, and his throat didn't bother him. He left the clinic a happy man. Whenever the symptoms of his illness occurred, he would just hold his breath for a short time, and his body would function normally. After a few months, he lost his fears and his symptoms disappeared. This happened more than thirty years ago. He hasn't required medical attention since. Of course, not all cures are so easily affected. There are times when you may have to use all your resources before aid is found. However, it is wise to continue the search with persistence and a positive mental attitude. Such determination and optimism usually pay off. It did for another sales manager. Let us tell you about him. There is always a cure. Find it. This particular sales manager registered in a small-town hotel and fell and broke a leg as he entered the room assigned to him. The hotel manager took our sales manager to the nearest hospital where an attending physician set his leg. A few days later, it was considered safe for him to be moved, and he returned to his home. 
he convalesced for several weeks under the attention of his family physician, but while he seemed to improve, the fracture did not heal. After many weeks, the doctor told him that he would get progressively worse. He would become a cripple. This sales manager was very much disturbed because his work required that he be on his feet. He discussed the matter with one of the authors, who said, Don't believe it. There is always a cure. Find it. Take the guesswork out of it. Do it now. He was told the story of the automobile sales manager, as it has been told to you, and it was suggested that he make arrangements to go to Mayo Brothers Clinic. He also left the clinic a happy man. Why? He was told, Your system needs calcium. We would load you with it, but the calcium would wear off. Just drink a quart of milk a day. He did. In time, the injured leg became as strong as the sound one. A positive mental attitude applied to health takes into consideration the possibility of accidents. In fact, safety first is a PMA symbol. From it, you receive the suggestion to become alert and enforce your desire to live, to save life and property. Be sure you're not driving to your own funeral. A newspaper article carried a headline reading, Late for a Funeral, Six Die in 100 Mile Per Hour Blowout. The lead read, Six funerals were precipitated Sunday by the crash of an automobile whose driver was stepping on the gas in fear he and his relatives would be late for one funeral. Drive carefully if you want to be physically and mentally healthy, and if you want to live longer. As a pedestrian, be alerted to the hazards and obey traffic laws. And when you ride with another person at the wheel of the automobile, remember you are at the mercy of his physical and mental weaknesses, if any, as well as the mechanical condition of his car. Have the courage to refuse to ride with an intoxicated driver or in an automobile in which the brakes don't operate properly, even if you own the car. The life you save may be your own. Safety First Saves Lives with PMA Although it cost $1 million a floor for each of its 41 stories, the Prudential Building in Chicago was the most inexpensive office building of its kind ever constructed. Why? It didn't cost a single life. There were no serious accidents. Safety factors were installed because of PMA. In comparison, negative mental attitudes comprising ignorance and carelessness caused in tragic accidents one death for every 100 feet of height of the Empire State Building, 110 deaths in the construction of Hoover Dam, one life for every 110 feet in the construction of the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge. 80 deaths in the construction of the Colorado River Aqueduct. 1,219 deaths in the construction of the Panama Canal. There were 4,766 additional fatalities during the construction of this project from other causes. 97 deaths in the building of Grand Coulee Dam and the Columbia River Basin Project. Of course, no one actually knows when tragedy will strike, but it always is better to be prepared. You will be prepared if you have a positive mental attitude. Aunt Kitty was. When Tragedy Strikes Aunt Kitty lost her only son when he was nine years old. Like many good housewives and mothers, she had no business training. But Aunt Kitty did have a strong religious faith. She knew that in spite of her great loss, it was her job to go on living and contributing her share to make this world a better world to live in. But how could she maintain physical and mental health so that she could go on? Aunt Kitty decided that in order to ease her pain and fill the great void in her life, she would have to keep very busy and do whatever her abilities would permit to make other people happy, since she could no longer do this for her son. So she got a job as a waitress in a busy restaurant. Her hours were long. Her work made it mandatory to talk with people and to act cheerful. Faith in her religion and a sincere interest in other people, combined with work and time, neutralized her pain and saved her physical and mental health. Actually, your health may be affected by many internal influences. 
and some of these influences may be mental figments of the imagination. High school girl gets pains before examinations. Because of the interrelationship between the mind and body, the subconscious mind may create apparent bodily disorders induced by emotional disturbances to bring about a specific desired result. A true life experience will prove the point. A high school girl experienced severe backaches the morning of any day on which she was to take a German or history examination. She didn't like either subject. She wasn't properly prepared. Her pains were so severe that she believed she couldn't get up from bed. She was not pretending. She suffered. A peculiar characteristic of the pain was that at about 3.30 in the afternoon, when school was over for the day, the pain would subside. On the same evening when her boyfriend came to call, the pain would marvelously disappear. This girl, you probably are thinking, could do with a little psychiatry. She could. She and many others like her have been helped through religion and psychiatry. The two are not as far apart as many may think. Why? Religion and Psychiatry Rules and regulations for physical and mental health and a longer life were woven into religion long before words similar to physiology, psychology, and psychiatry became part of any language. This is especially true regarding the application of techniques affecting the subconscious mind. It is easy to see why psychiatric clinics and counseling services are becoming an integral part of church organizations regardless of their religious denominations. The Minister to Millions Helps the Sick The Rev. Norman Vincent Peel and Smiley Blanton, M.D., established the American Foundation of Religion and Psychiatry which is now known as the Institutes of Religion and Health. It is a non-profit, non-sectarian clinic in New York City. Anyone with an emotional problem is eligible for help regardless of race, religion, or ability to pay. Today, there is a full and part-time professional staff of 35 composed of psychiatrists, ministers, psychologists, and psychiatric social workers. If you would like information on how to establish a counseling service in your church, write the Institutes. What Lies Ahead Mental and physical health are two great rewards of a positive mental attitude. It is true, a positive mental attitude takes effort, patience, and practice to gain and maintain. But a definite purpose, clean and clear thinking, creative vision, courageous action, Persistence and true perception, all applied with enthusiasm and faith, will go far to help you achieve and maintain a positive mental attitude. And what lies ahead as you approach your definite goals? Happiness lies ahead. If you are happy now, you will wish to maintain and increase this wonderful happiness which you already have. If you are not happy now, you will want to learn how you can be happy. Let's turn to Chapter 18, entitled, Can You Attract Happiness?, to find additional PMA success principles to speed us in our pursuit of happiness. Pilot Number 17. Thoughts to Steer By 1. You can have more perfect health. A positive mental attitude affects your health. It attracts good health to you. A negative mental attitude attracts ill health. 2. Thinking good thoughts, positive and cheerful thoughts, will improve the way you feel. What affects your mind also affects your body. 3. A positive mental attitude toward the ones you love may be the means of saving their lives. Remember the father who saved the life of his infant son by going into action with a positive mental attitude. 4. Learn to practice PMA instead of giving in to NMA, as the engineer's wife did. Her NMA allowed death to claim her. 5. Develop within you a positive mental attitude, so powerful that it seeps down from your conscious into your subconscious mind. If you do, you will find that in times of need and emergency, it will automatically flash back to your conscious mind even in the greatest emergency of life.
death. 6. Make a study of the Bible and other inspirational books. They will both inspire and teach you how to motivate yourself to positive desirable action and thus help you achieve the goals you desire. 7. Learn to use the 17 success principles and to apply them to your life. Have you memorized them? 8. All the wealth in the world cannot by itself buy good health. But you can achieve good health by striving for it and observing simple rules of hygiene and good health habits. Remember, John D. Rockefeller had to retire at the age of 57 because of ill health. But through a positive mental attitude and wholesome living, he reached the ripe old age of 97. 9. PMA recognizes the importance of education in physical, mental, and social hygiene, and that ignorance of these subjects can mean sin, sickness, and death. Keep abreast of current developments affecting your mental, moral, and physical health. 10. Never abandon hope, for there is a potential cure for every ailment. Develop PMA and take the guesswork out of your health by seeking aid at the right time. 11. PMA repels accidents and tragedies by keeping the person with PMA alert to dangers at all times. Should tragedy strike, however, PMA can guide you in meeting reverses calmly and deliberately. 12. A sound mind and sound body are attainable if you will put PMA to work for you. Remember, you can enjoy good health and live longer with PMA. I feel healthy. I feel happy. I feel terrific. Chapter 18. Can You Attract Happiness? Can you attract happiness? Abraham Lincoln once made the remark, It has been my observation that people are just about as happy as they make up their minds to be. There is very little difference in people, but that little difference makes a big difference. The little difference is attitude. The big difference is whether it is positive or negative. Persons who want to be happy will adopt a positive mental attitude and be influenced by the PMA side of their talisman. Thus, happiness will be attracted to them. And those who turn on NMA make a business of being unhappy. They don't attract. They repel happiness. I want to be happy. A popular song starts off with the words that contain a great deal of truth. I want to be happy, but I won't be happy till I make you happy too. One of the surest ways to find happiness for yourself is to devote your energies toward making someone else happy. Happiness is an elusive transitory thing, and if you set out to search for it, you will find it evasive. But if you try to bring happiness to someone else, then it comes to you. Writer Claire Jones, wife of a professor in the religion department at Oklahoma City University, tells of a happiness they experienced during their early married life. We lived in a small town the first two years we were married, she recalls, and our neighbors were a very old couple, the wife nearly blind and confined to a wheelchair. The old man, not very well himself, kept house and cared for her. My husband and I were decorating our Christmas tree a few days before Christmas when we decided on impulse to fix a tree for the old people. We bought a small one, decorated it with tinsel and lights, wrapped a few small gifts, and took it over the night before Christmas. The old lady cried as she gazed dimly at the sparkling lights. Her husband said over and over, But it's been years since we had a tree. They mentioned that tree nearly every time we visited them during the next year. The next Christmas, they were both gone from the little house. It was a small thing we had done for them, but we were happy that we'd done it. Now the happiness they experienced as a result of their kindness was a very deep, warm feeling, the memory of which will remain with them. It was a very special kind of happiness that comes to those who do kind deeds. But the kind of happiness which is most common and most constant comes closer to being a state of contentment, a state of being neither happy nor unhappy. You are a happy person during a period 
when you predominantly experience that positive state of mind in which you are happy combined with that neutral state of mind in which you are not unhappy. And you can be happy, content, or unhappy, for the choice is yours. The determining factor is whether you are under the influence of a positive or negative mental attitude, and that factor you can control. Handicaps are no barrier to happiness. Surely if ever there was a person who might have been expected to complain of unhappiness, Helen Keller was that person. Born deaf, mute, and blind, deprived of knowledge of normal communication with the persons who surrounded her, she had only her sense of touch to help her to reach out to others and to experience the happiness of loving and being loved. But reach out she did, and through the aid of a devoted and brilliant teacher who in love reached out to Helen Keller, that deaf, mute, and blind little girl became a brilliant, joyful, happy woman. Miss Keller once wrote, Anyone who out of the goodness of his heart speaks a helpful word, gives a cheering smile, or smooths over a rough place in another's path, knows that the delight he feels is so intimate a part of himself that he lives by it. The joy of surmounting obstacles which once seemed unremovable, and pushing the frontier of accomplishment further, what joy is there like unto it? If those who seek happiness would stop one little minute and think, they would see that the delights they already experience are as countless as the grasses at their feet, or the dewdrops sparkling upon the morning flowers. Helen Keller counted her blessings and was profoundly grateful for them. Then she shared the wonder of these blessings with others, and caused them to feel delight. Because she shared that which is good and desirable, she attracted unto herself more of that which is good and desirable. For the more you share, the more you will have. And if you share happiness with others, happiness will grow richer within you. But if you share misery and unhappiness, you will attract misery and unhappiness to yourself. And we all know of persons who are eternally having troubles, not problems or opportunities in disguise. Theirs are spelled T-R-O-U-B-L-E. No matter what happens to them, it just isn't good. And this is because they are always sharing their troubles with others. Now there are many lonely people in this world who long for love and friendship but never seem to get it. Some repel that which they seek with NMA. Others curl up in their little corners and never venture out. They secretly hope that something good will come to them but they do not share any of the good which they enjoy. They do not realize that when you withhold from others that which you have which is good and desirable, your own portion of the good and desirable diminishes. Others, however, have the courage to do something about their loneliness, and they find their answer in sharing the good and beautiful with others. There was one such little boy who was a very lonely, unhappy little boy indeed. When he was born, his backbone was arched into a grotesque hump, and his left leg was crooked. Looking at the infant, the doctor assured the boy's father, but he'll get along all right. The family was poor, and the baby's mother died before he was a year old. As he grew up, other children shunned him because of his misshapen body and his inability to participate successfully in many of their activities. Charles Steinmetz was his name and he was a lonely, unhappy little fellow. But the great giver of all good had not overlooked this little fellow. To compensate for his misshapen body, Charles had been endowed with an extraordinarily keen mind. Using the greatest asset available to him, Charles ignored his physical disabilities about which he felt he could do nothing and worked to excel with his mind. At five, he could conjugate Latin verbs, at seven, he learned Greek and a smattering of Hebrew. At eight, he had a good understanding of algebra and geometry. When he went on to college, he excelled in all his studies. In fact, he was graduated with honors. He had carefully saved his pennies so he could rent a dress suit for the occasion. But with the inconsiderate cruelty that is so often characteristic of persons under the influence of NMA— the school authorities posted a notice on the bulletin board excusing Charles from the ceremonies. 
At long last, it occurred to Charles that instead of trying to force respect for himself from people by making them take notice of his mental capacities, he would cultivate their friendship. He would use his abilities not to attract notice and to satisfy his own ego, but for the furtherance of the good of mankind. To start his new way of life, he boarded a ship and came to America. Having reached this country, Charles Steinmetz began to look for a job. Several times he was rebuffed because of his appearance, but he finally landed a job with General Electric as a draftsman at $12 a week. In addition to his regular duties, he spent long hours in electrical research, and he endeavored to cultivate the friendship of his fellow employees by trying to share with them that which he had that was good and desirable. After some time, the chairman of the board of General Electric Company recognized the rare genius of this man and said to Charles, Here is our entire plant. Do anything you want with it. Dream all day if you wish. We'll pay you for dreaming. Charles worked hard, long, and earnestly. During his lifetime, he patented more than 200 electrical inventions and wrote many books and papers on problems of electrical theory and engineering. He knew the satisfaction of a job well done, and he also knew the satisfaction of making contributions which went far to make this world a better place to live in. He accumulated wealth and acquired a lovely home which he shared with a young couple he knew. Thus Steinmetz experienced the happiness of a full and useful life. Happiness Begins at Home The greater part of the life of each of us is spent in our homes with our families. And unfortunately, that dwelling which should be a haven of love, happiness, and security too often turns into an antagonistic place where the members do not enjoy happy and harmonious relationships. Problems in the home can arise for many reasons. In one of our PMA Science of Success classes, a very gifted, aggressive young man of about 24 was asked, Have you a problem? Yes, he replied. My mother. In fact, I have decided to leave home this weekend. When the student was asked to discuss his problem, it became evident that the relationship between him and his mother was not harmonious. It was apparent to the instructor that her aggressive, dominant personality was similar to his. The class was informed that the personality of an individual can be compared to the powers of a magnet. When two like powers are in line and push or pull in the same direction, they are drawn to each other by attraction. When the powers are opposed to each other, they resist and repel one another. When they are placed side by side and both confront the same outside forces, the individuals, like the magnets, remain separate entities. Yet their strength to attract and repel these forces is increased even though between themselves they are opposed. The instructor continued by saying, it appears that your behavior and that of your mother are so similar that you can determine how she reacts to you by the way you react to her. You can probably evaluate her feelings by analyzing your own. Therefore, you can solve your problem easily. When two forceful personalities are opposed, and it is desirable that they live together in harmony, at least one must use the power of PMA. Here's your specific assignment for this week. When your mother asks you to do something, do it cheerfully. When she expresses an opinion, agree with her in a pleasant, sincere manner or don't say anything. When you are tempted to find fault with her, find something good to say. You will have a most pleasant experience. She will probably follow your example. It won't work, responded the student. She is just too hard to get along with. You're absolutely right, responded the instructor. It won't work unless you try to work it with a positive mental attitude. A week later, the young man was asked how he was coming along with his problem. His response was, I am happy to say that there hasn't been one unpleasant word between us all week. You might be interested in knowing that I have decided to stay at home. When Parents Don't Understand Their Children there is a tendency for a person to assume that everyone always likes what he likes and always thinks the way he thinks. For people have a tendency to judge the reactions of others by their own reactions. Now, like the young man who had a problem with his mother, 
such a conclusion would at times be correct. But many parents often have problems with their children because they fail to realize that the personality of the child is different from theirs. It is a mistake for parents not to realize that time changes both the child and them. For they don't adjust their mental attitudes to compensate for the changes within the child and themselves. I don't understand her, the father said. A lawyer and his wife had five wonderful children. The parents were unhappy because their oldest daughter, who was a freshman in high school, didn't respond to her parents the way they expected. The daughter was unhappy, too. She's a good girl, but I don't understand her, the father said. She doesn't like to do work around the house, yet she'll toil for hours at the piano. In the summer, I got her a job at the department store, but she didn't want to work. She just wants to play the piano all day. It was our recommendation that the parents and daughter be given an activity vector analysis by one of the authors. In Chapter 10, entitled How to Motivate Others, you heard about activity vector analysis. These results were very revealing. We found that the girl possessed ambitions, energies, and traits so far beyond either of the parents that it would be difficult for them to comprehend her reactions to them until they understood that each person is different. The parents thought that while it was nice to know how to play a piano, it was good for a girl to work at home and work in a store in the summer. A passion to be a pianist was just a waste of time. She will get married some day and will have to keep house. She should be more practical, the parents reasoned. The daughter's capacities and the tendencies that motivated her were explained to the parents. Reasons were given why it was hard for them to understand her. An explanation was also given to the daughter as to why her parents thought one way and she another. When the three endeavored to understand what brought about their problem and how they could adjust to it with a positive mental attitude, they were able to live together in greater harmony. To have a happy home, be understanding. To be happy, be understanding of other people. Realize that another person's energy level and capacities may not be the same as yours. He may not think like you. Try to understand that what he likes may not be what you like. When you realize this, you will find it easier to develop a PMA in yourself and to do that which will create desirable reactions in others. Opposite poles of a magnet attract each other, and so do persons with opposite personality traits. And where there is a community of interest, two individuals may experience a happy association together, although each has opposite characteristics in many respects. One may be ambitious, aggressive, confident, and optimistic, and possess tremendous drive, energy, and stick to The other may have a tendency to be satisfied, fearful, timid, shy, tactful, and humble, and may lack confidence in himself. Often such persons are attracted to each other, and when associated together, complement, strengthen, and inspire each other. And they blend their personalities, and thus the extremes of each become neutralized. What would grow into rigidity on the part of one and frustration on the part of the other is thus avoided. Would you be happy and inspired if you were married to a person whose personality was exactly like yours? Be truthful with yourself. The answer would probably be no. Children, too, can be taught to be understanding and to be appreciative of all that their parents do for them. Much unhappiness is caused in homes because the children do not appreciate and understand their parents. But whose fault is it? The child's or the parent's or both? Some time ago, we had an appointment with the president of a large and successful organization. His name has appeared in a favorable light in every large newspaper in the country for the good work he did while holding public office. Yet on the day we saw him, he was most unhappy. No one likes me. Even my children hate me. Why is this, he asked. Actually, this man is a person of good intent. He gave his children everything that money would buy. He deliberately kept them from the needs that forced him as a child to gain the strength he developed as a man. He tried to protect them from those things in life that to him were not beautiful. 
He eliminated the necessity for them to struggle as he had had to struggle. He never asked or expected appreciation from his sons and daughters when they were children, and he never got it. Yet he assumed that they understood him without endeavoring to find out. Things would have been different had he taught his children to be appreciative and to gain strength by at least partially fighting their own battles. He experienced happiness in making them happy without teaching them to be happy by making others happy. Therefore, they made him unhappy. Perhaps if he had confided in them when they were growing up and told of the struggles he had endured for their benefit, they might have been more understanding. But there is no need for this man or anyone in a like situation to remain unhappy. He can turn up the PMA side of his talisman and try earnestly to make himself known to and understood by his dear ones. And he can take the time to show that he loves them by sharing himself instead of just giving them those material things with which his wealth can supply them. If he shares himself as liberally as he shared his money with them, he will experience the rich reward of having them return love and understanding to him. Of course this man had meant well. He had the right intent toward his children and toward others, but he had not been sensitive to their reactions. He had simply assumed that they would understand, and he had not taken the time to help them to do so. Now this man could help himself by reading inspirational books. We recommended several, including How to Win Friends and Influence People, and we told him that his children were people.